Okay, so it's 6.30, so bonjour. My name is Pierre Lebel. I'm the uh, Education Officer for the NCR. Uh, welcome to this webinar on the use of special leave, code, code uh, 699. We, we have 200 registered. We have 60 people have uh, connected right now. So while we go through the, the motions of explaining how to, how to navigate, go to webinar, people will have time to, to get in. Without further ado, I will ask uh, Alex Silas. Alex is the uh, Regional Vice President for the National Capital Region and will want to say a few words. So Alex, go ahead. Merci beaucoup, confrère. Uh, I won't take up too much time. I just want to welcome everyone and thank everyone for taking the time to join and engage on this incredibly important issue. Thank you for spending your evening uh, with us to learn more about uh, 699 leave, the applications, and what to do if you're denied it. I want to encourage everyone to be sponges tonight. You're going to get some great information from Pia and from Yafa, uh, and they're going to answer your questions about how to access 699 leave, what to do if you're denied 699 leave. Uh, so thank you everyone for, for engaging on this issue. Uh, also, I want to say that um, just, just so everyone understands, and, and this will be in detail in the presentation, but the Treasury Board's change in policy constitutes a violation of our collective agreement and the language around the use of 699 leave. Uh, so I want to encourage folks at the local level to also uh, file grievances when there's grounds for grievances. Talk to stewards in your local, talk to your local executives, your component reps about preparing grievances because it's important to support our larger policy grievances on this to also file ind individual grievances at the local level. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep it at that. I know everyone is eager to, to get on with the presentation. Thanks everyone for joining. Have a great webinar. Solidarity. Merci, Alex. Thank Merci. you. So we we'll go through the agenda and um, so, and I will introduce Yafa. So basically, we did the webinar skipping. We'll go through the what is uh, 699 leave, and then how does that leave work for Theresa Ward and separate agencies employee, the grievance process, and the battle that we are facing right now. What can you do if you are facing challenges assessing, assessing the the leave? Some scenarios, and and we'll finish up with the question and answer qu uh, period. And uh, I just want to refer you, if you have any question, the best way for us to, to deal with the, the, the number of questions would be to, if you can write them in the question box, we'll make sure that we can uh, answer as many questions as we, uh, we, as we can. And also, because the way GoToWebinar works, all your written questions would be kept uh, in a report. So if, if for any reason we, we are not able to answer your question, we we'll keep those questions and we can refer, we'll have your question and your email so we can uh, follow up with you if uh, there's uh, any uh, any particular thing we need to do to answer your questions. So, so, uh, so I will introduce Yafa Jara. Yafa is a grievance and education officer at the PSEC and she will be the main presenter tonight. So Yafa, it's your show. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, uh, um, everybody who's attending uh, this evening. I know it's an evening, it's the middle of a pandemic, uh, and we really appreciate you being here tonight. Um, my name is Yafa Gerard, and I am a grievance and adjudication officer at uh, the Representation and Legal Services Branch at PSAC. Um, I have been involved in, uh, uh, um, along with uh, a few other colleagues, in filing and presenting the 699 leave grievances on behalf of PSAC and, uh, of course, on behalf of the uh, members. So. Um, this evening, as was mentioned, I will be uh, presenting on what is 699 leave, how does 699 leave work for uh, Treasury Board and separate agencies' employees, uh, the grievance procedure and uh, process, and the labor and legal battle, uh, kind of try to explain what that looks like, um, because I understand it's not a, a straightforward process and uh, there may be some confusions as to how that works. Uh, I will also speak on what you can do if you are facing challenges accessing 699 leave. And then we will uh, wrap it up with a couple of scenarios um, that we can present to you um, to kind of just show what kind of examples appear when we uh, face issues with 699 uh, or confusions as to who's eligible and where. So to start with, um, I will start with uh, what is 699 leave? 
Now, we understand that um, a big challenge in understanding exactly what circumstances make a member or an employee eligible for 699 leave, there has, there has been a lot of confusion. Um, and part of the confusion is due to the fact, um, and we always, you know, I we like to start um, talking about 699 leave just with giving this caveat that part of the confusion is due to the fact that the employer or the employers themselves um, do not really exactly know um, or have been kind of changing how to apply 699 leave. A lot of changes, um, there has been a lot of mixed messages and uh, unclear guidelines, uh, which have made it almost impossible to pinpoint from the employer's perspective, when does a member or an employee become eligible to access 699. But I do want to say, as Alex mentioned, um, that from our perspective at PSCC and based on the directives issued by the employer uh, back in May of 2020, as well as our understanding of the collective agreements um, that we are a part of, 699 leave is in place to respond to a novel and unique situation that is COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and it directly correlates uh, with leave with pay for other reasons. Uh, these provisions exist in various collective agreements. They don't all uh, have the exact same number and in terms of articles, but they do exist in all of our collective agreements. So as an example, just for ease of reference, I will use Article 5301 of the Programs and Administrative Services Collective Agreement, which is referred to as the PA Collective Agreement. Article 53 um, is titled Leave With or Without Pay for Other Reasons. In particular, um, Article 5301, uh, subsection A, uh, basically um, states that at the discretion of the employer, the employer may grant leave with pay when circumstances that are not directly attributed to the employee prevent his or her reporting for duty. Um, such leave, the article says, shall not be unreasonably withheld. So. 699 leave um, is, is just a code, right? The number 699 is just a code that's implemented to uh, so members and employees can utilize this part of the collective agreement and can use it, right? Um, it's not a leave uh, or a code that was uh, magically created by the employer because of COVID-19, right? It existed before COVID-19. It has always existed as long as these provisions in the collective agreement have been negotiated. Um, it had been there before uh, COVID, as I mentioned. Um, some examples just to make it um, you know, uh, clearer as to when have these provisions been used in the past by, by employees before COVID? We rely in terms of um, legal precedent uh, or, or legal cases on what we refer to as the snowstorm cases. So in scenarios, which I'm sure some of you have faced in the past, where you're traveling, um, whether it be for work or not for work, and there are snowstorms and you're prevented for reasons that are outside of your control um, to return back on time to the workplace because the, um, because the flights have been canceled, right? So this is a situation where you, you know, uh, employees would contact the employer and say, I'm unable to get on the plane because they have suspended all the flights um, for the next couple of days. We see this example uh, appear particularly in the eastern parts of the country, um, uh, for example, Newfoundland or PEI, where um, it's much harder, uh, the snowstorms are much harsher and, and there's um, regular closures for, for, um, uh, for airplanes and, and flights. So this is, these are situations where this particular leave has been utilized, right? So uh, you will be eligible for um, uh, paid leave because you are unable to attend or go back to work 
for reasons that are really outside of your uh, control. Um, so we're basing basically the legal arguments in terms of interpretation of this article um, partially uh, on, on uh, the precedent of these, of these, um, of these cases. Um, so how does 699 leave work uh, for Treasury Board and for different empl em employers? Um, what is the employer's policy? So here, um, I would like to refer you to the uh, document that in the handouts that was uploaded called Frequently Asked Questions, 699 Leave. Um, and this document, I just, it, it says it in the beginning, I just wanna note that um, these are the guidelines and policies that the employers have implemented in regards to 699 leave. These aren't necessarily guidelines that we agreed to at PSAC. In fact, and I will speak about this in a bit, we are challenging them um, legally through policy grievances. But um, this document um, comes from the employer themselves kind of interpreting their own policy and making it a little bit more clear. So I think part of the, um, the battle and, and the, the way that you know, uh, we can challenge 699 leave policy uh, would be best is if we understand the policy that the employer has as best as we can, right? Uh, we wanna know exactly according to the policy, um, what does the employer mean uh, when they say you are eligible, but you are not eligible. Uh, and the reason for that is, well, A, because uh, if there's issues with the policy, then we have to challenge it through a policy grievance. But most importantly, um, we have noticed that different managers and different supervisors and different departments uh, and different employers have been um, implementing their own policy differently. It not, it's not consistent. And in many cases, if not a lot of cases, they have been uh, implementing it in the wrong way, right? So they're, they're violating their own policy, even if the policy itself is not, is not a good one, um, they're still violating it, they're not following it. So um, we have to be um, alerted to that. Of course, uh, we're here to, to help with any examples that you may face in order to assess whether there's a violation of the policy or not. Um, so this is why uh, I'm including this part today. In a nutshell, and you know, you can browse through these frequently asked questions, they're not complete or comprehensive in any way. We have received uh, from members many other uh, questions that expand on that and, uh, you know, but, but this hopefully will bring together um, the policy as it exists today with the changes that were implemented uh, recently, just in November of, uh, of last year. So in a nutshell, 699 leave, um, according to the employer's own policy, will be granted on a case by case basis. Um, the employer here is saying that they're going to assess each situation separately and then decide if a member is eligible. A large amount of discretion here is given to individual managers to determine who's eligible, what examples um, work for 699 and which ones don't, right? Um, and only uh, after remote and alternative work options or flexible work hours have been considered um, and generally only after other relevant paid leaves have first been used and exhausted then an employee may be eligible for 699 leave so it really leaves very small room according to this policy where someone will be eligible for it um, and the limitations to that kind of started becoming more clear and more restrictive after November 9th, uh, 2020 changes to the guidelines. And that's when, uh, I'm sure a lot of you noticed, that's when the employer says, um, you have to first use other leaves, such as vacation, family leave, um, sick leave, any leave really that is available in the collective agreement before. And once those are finished, then maybe you, you will be eligible for 699 leave. And I will get to that uh, shortly, how that's problematic from our perspective in terms of violation and interpretation of the collective agreements.
So uh, basically, once all of these options have been considered, and management uh, and the managers have consulted, in some cases, with their labor relations advisors, then uh, 699 leave with pay could be available in situations, in certain situations. And here I want to stress the word could that the employer uses, and this goes back to the issue of discretion that uh, the employer gives itself. Um, but that discretion is also available in the collective agreement, right? So. Um, According to their own policy, um, this leave could be available in situations where an employee has work or technological limitations. So we can think about situations and scenarios where an employee lives maybe in a rural area where they don't have reception, um, there's no Wi-Fi, um, it's really difficult to get any kind of connection so they cannot complete tasks um, on the computer where otherwise they would be if they didn't live in that area. Uh, in situations where an employee cannot work remotely uh, and has been diagnosed with COVID-19, this is not entirely accurate because uh, the employer here is saying that even if you are diagnosed with COVID-19, and you can see that in the frequently asked questions um, page, uh, where it says, what if I tested positive? So even if you test positive for COVID-19, you have to use your sick leave first. If there's insufficient sick leaves in your in your sick leave bank, um, then you may be uh, eligible for six, or you may access 699 leave. So it, it's not enough that someone is just simply diagnosed with COVID-19 or tested positive. Um, same thing if you're experiencing symptoms, but haven't tested or tested negative right? Um, same thing if you're required to self-isolate uh, or quarantine. Again, for that period, um, you are required to dig into other, other leaves first. Uh, if you are a caregiver and have uh, caregiving responsibilities as a result of things such as school closures or day take, daycare closures or um, COVID-19 illnesses or uh, isolation requirements, um, again, this was the pith and substance of our initial policy grievance. Uh, so we have three of them and I will talk about them in a bit, but this was basically the pith and substance of the first one uh, that we filed, which uh, basically does not give uh, parents in particular and, and caregivers um, the opportunity to access this leave when uh, schools are closed. So you are in a situation where um, a lot of our members are in a situation where they're at home, sure they can work remotely because they have the computer and uh, the tasks allow them to do that, but they have children um, who are you know, in the background and require care and require attention. Um, so they're unable to, to complete the work and the tasks because children are home and everything is closed so it's not that it's not that easy to even if they have alternative child care um, help uh, through family or friends with COVID restrictions they can't simply just go drop off their kids at their their parents or their family members right so um, we challenged that we said you know uh, people in this situation or even uh, people are looking after their elderly parents or their their spouses or family members um, should also have access to that if they're unable to sit down at a computer and complete the work even if they're home right um, the other situation according to the employer is if um, an employee cannot work remotely and is at high risk or has someone in their care who is at high risk of severe illness from COVID. Um, again, the, a lot of the different departments and some managers and supervisors have not been implementing this particular scenario consistently. Um, so in situations where, as I mentioned, you're taking care of an elderly parent, for example, or uh, someone who's sick, um, who's in your care, um, or has tested positive for, for COVID-19. Um, the employer is now requiring that um, employees access family leave, sick leave, vacation leave, before they can access 699 leave. 
Um, if we look at the frequently asked questions, um, and I won't read them uh, out loud because the document is right there, and I'm sure we're going to be talking about all of these examples, but one of the things that we noticed is, okay, well then, someone might ask, when does one become eligible for 699 leave without having to go through everything else, other, you know, other, other leaves and accessing other leaves? According to their own policy, and if we want to do the math, the only time where 699 leave will be given right away is the time uh, that when, if you want to go get tested for COVID-19, from the time you go get the test until the time that you receive the test result. So only during that period of time. If it's two hours, that's two hours of 699 leave. If it's two days, then that's two days of 699 leave. After you receive the, the test and the results from the COVID test, if you test positive, then you have to dig into your sick leave first. If you test negative and you're still required to self-isolate, same thing. So um, just looking at it as of now, in terms of the policy, these are the only times where 699 leave appears to be an automatic um, access uh, uh, or, or employees have automatic access to 699 leave. Now, um, we would welcome any examples if anybody has experienced uh, something different or otherwise, um, please let us know. But this is up until now the information that we have. Um, so um, there's another element to uh, how the employer has been implementing 699 leave. And the other one, I think we can move to the uh, to the next slide, um, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe Okay, no, then we can go to the to the one before that. Sorry, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, another thing that I would like to point out before we move on is the issue of uh, flexible work hours and remote work, right? So according to the employer's policy, they're required to find alternatives, alternative work first for you. If you can't, let's say, if your workplace is um, requiring you to report to the workplace, and you request 699 leave. The employer first should look into remote work options and alternative work options, right? Um, they have confirmed that whatever they consider as an alternative work that can be completed from home would be the same classification and same pay. So you might not be performing the same performances that you would otherwise in the workplace because of uh, workplace requirement or, or the procedural requirements, and that is fine. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, you will find that you will have to to be doing that and sacri not sacrificing, but doing things slightly differently in regards to the tasks that you complete from home. But we have to make sure that the hours of work and the classification, which is the pay and, and all of that, um, are the same as your substantive. And again, if that is not the case, then that's a problem that we need to be aware of and that we need to challenge. Um, the other important aspect that I wanna point out here is the employer, and that's the pith and substance of our latest grievance, which I'll get into, has been asking um, uh, employees and our members to work flexible work hours uh, if possible um, before accessing 699. And what the employer means by flexible work arrangement is extending the the work uh, week to be seven days a week and the uh, hours of work to be 24 hours a day. So if your collective agreement says that your uh, hours of work are, uh, you know, from 9 a.m. to till 5 p.m. or 6 p.m., um, then in this case the employer is saying, let's not let's flex that. Let's flex that. If you need the the 699 leave from two to four uh, because you need to feed your kids during that time. Um, can you do the work um, for that? So instead of going on paid sick leave, can, uh, sorry, and um, paid leave, can you do the work in the evening or on the weekends? Now, there are problems with that and we're gonna get into that in a bit, but this is one of the, um, the alternatives that the employer has been uh, implementing in that regard. Um, we talked about if your family member or you tested positive, again, you're going to be required to, um, to dig into other, uh, other leaves before, um, 
before you can access that. One uh, last point I want to make just to um, uh, before we move on on this is um, the uh, the point about documentation. So when you request 699 leave, the employer may ask for documentation to kind of um, 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 to uh, to justify or to assess the the leave request. This is not in general asking for uh, medical documents or a doctor certificate or something to prove that you need to go on 699 is not unreasonable right from the you know it's not an unreasonable practice on its own for the employer however we have to be careful and we have to check with the union check with your with your reps as to the type of documentation and the type of questions that the employer is asking uh, when you submit these leaves. We have noticed that uh, some of the questionnaires, some of the questions that have been asked um, paused issues regarding privacy and uh, confidentiality um, and documentation that go above and beyond what is what the employer is um, um, you know can can ask and access. So for example, a doctor's note um, or a certificate can say, this member is at high risk. This member um, should be working from home um, because they're at high risk. That's fine. But when the employer starts asking more questions about the medical condition and all of that kind of stuff, then here we're, we're also facing another problem that needs to be challenged. So um, we're going to get to that into a little bit more detail in a bit, but I just wanted to point that it is okay for the employer to ask for documents and documentation when you do the 699 leave request but again um th there is there is kind of what is reasonable and what is not and again you can always uh check with your um local representatives if you're in doubt um i guess we we're ready now to do um to move on to the to the uh question that we would like to um to ask to ask of you and i'm not really sure if you are, yeah i'll, I'll yeah, let you uh, okay <laughs> thank you so you have the question on your screen so and uh go to webinar as a poll uh option so what i'll do while i read uh the you'll be able to uh, so the the question is since the start of the pandemic have you requested a special leave code 699 and the uh, so i'll launch the poll you can click by basically you'll see the poll and you can click by clicking on the, I, you, you guys are fantastic. It's, I'm getting the response, uh, getting on. So I'll leave you a few seconds. So that will help Yafa to know uh, how many people. So we are 112 uh, participants tonight. So that's great. Uh, so leaving you a few more seconds to answer your question. And then we'll share the, the result of the, of the poll. So 80% of you guys have already voted. So I'll close in 10 seconds if you, it's time for you and if you don't if you're not able to click on the answer you can answer in the chat uh, in the question box so uh, we'll see your answers as well so okay so that's great so we'll close the poll and i'll share the result so i'll share with you so basically uh, 54 percent of you guys already have requested a 699 leave and 46 have not so Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll we go back to the presentation yeah Pat? thank you uh wow this is this is good um so i'm 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 assuming we have a lot of examples from some of the audience you know uh that are attending today to give us i just before before i move on i just noticed a question in the question box that says the front page of the frequently asked questions says should be february 2021 and not february 2020 that's correct thank you for catching that so uh, if it's possible at all to uh, just fix that and re-upload the frequently asked questions, that would be great. Thank you for, for catching that. That's an important error that you caught there. Um, okay, so I guess um, our next would be uh, in regards to the grievance procedure and process and uh, the legal battle. What is PSAC doing about it? Um, as I mentioned before, um, um yeah uh, so as i mentioned before we psc we are challenging the the policy through policy grievances we're going through the policy procedure 
um, uh, that is outlined in the collective agreement. So whichever collective agreement that uh, may apply to you, there's always a provision about um, the grievance procedure and the grievance process. And that usually is consistent with labor laws. Um, so we kind of have to abide by that uh, when we are filing grievances and follow the procedure. Um, and many of you may have, or some of you may have in the past filed individual grievances for different reasons. Um, when it comes to uh, policy grievances, which is a different type of grievance, those grievances, um, usually they come from the union, right? Uh, so the union would file that on behalf of different exa multiple examples. When there's an issue uh, in terms of employer's policy that affects all members or even some members or a few members um, and we see that there's a problem with it in terms of violation of the collective agreement uh, and in this case we consider the policy of 699 aspects of it um, to be and the way that it's implemented to be uh, violate a lot of violations of the collective agreement so in that case um, what the union would do is um, through of course being aware that there are issues there from the membership um, and from the examples from the membership would say okay this is this triggers a policy uh, grievance and usually the outcome of the policy grievance um, you know um, could be for example um, changing the policy or that the policy is in fact a violation of the collective agreement um, or that certain aspects of the policy need to be need to stop happening uh, or need to be changed to something that is consistent with the collective agreement. The remedy in terms of the outcome of what may happen, uh, again, can vary depending on the nature of the policy grievance. But this is in a nutshell what happens. So as an example, if you have your collective agreements in front of you handy or not, it's fine. You don't need to follow up with the collective agreement. But I'm just giving an example from, again, I'm going to use the PA. Uh, collective agreement as an example, you have in the PA uh, collective agreement, Article 18 um, kind of outlines the grievance procedure, right? So in particular, Article 1804 talks about the policy grievances. So when we from the union want to file a policy grievance, we have to go to each collective agreement and follow that, um, go and follow, uh, see what the article basically um, states. Um, so in this case, um, uh, in this particular article, uh, we have that we have to follow um, and according to Section 220 of the Federal Public Sector Labor Relations Act. So this is the legislation basically that governs um, many of the ways that we um, that we do things in terms of um, adjudication, um, the grievance procedure and the grievance process and all of that kind of stuff. So this can be always consistent with that. Um, so I'm going to show you in a bit um, what a policy grievance looks like. But we have uploaded if we look at. Um, oh, I see here that it's already um, it's already shared, but a little bit, I think. Yeah, there we go. Um, so if also if you look at the handouts, I have uh, we have attached three different policy griev grievances that we have uh, filed uh, so far in regards to 699. So this is basically, oh, thank you for pulling out the policy grievance article. So right now we're looking at the policy grievance article here uh, where it says grievance procedure. Um, and in there, um, so what we do is we draft the policy grievance and we can look at that, those examples from the handouts that are um, attached here. So if you click on uh, any of the policy grievances, you'll be able to see them. Uh, we file that first with the employer. So we send it to the employer and here you can, again, you can see how it looks and who it's sent to and, and how it's signed, etc. cetera. Um, and then from there, the according to this one for example uh the employer will have he would tell you about the timelines um we would the employer would have um uh to, to kind of um 
um, schedule a presentation for for the uh, for the grievance. And in the PA uh, uh, collective agreement in particular, the policy grievance only has one level. Because um, some of you may know that for individual grievances, you go through first level, second level, level, third level, and sometimes the third level would be the final, or sometimes there's a fourth level. For the policy grievance in the PA, it's only one level, and that might differ in different collective agreements. So we file the grievance, and then we do the final presentation to the employer. Um, and then from there, the employer will have 30 days to respond um, uh, to the um, to the policy grievance, um, in in those um, uh, in those days, th again the employer could um, give you the response earlier. But after that, um, the union would have an opportunity to uh, to reply. Um, so things sometimes take a while to get results when when we talk about policy grievances because we are bound by these timelines right because we are bound by by this procedure and we have to follow it um in the in this particular case if you notice if you open the first uh, policy grievance um just to look at the wording as to what we try to do here uh so if we open um the first one actually no that would be for um we don't have the referral one up here um uploaded if we can upload that um that would be great and i can show it after okay yeah we have that um so here you can see on the screen um the policy grievance but in terms of the referral so for this particular one for the first one we did the presentation um back in July of last year. So we filed it in May, the first one. We did the presentation to the employer in July, and then uh, we received the employer's response. So if you click on the response, you will be able to see the employer's response here, uh, where they outline the reasons why uh, they either accept or deny the, the grievance. And here we see uh, from the employer's response, um, they kind of summarized what our arguments are, gave some of the reasons as to uh, why um, the, they don't see it the same way the union does, right? The employer doesn't necessarily see it as um, a policy per se. They see it as a, you know, a, 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 this is just a way of us reviewing case by case um, these employees. Another important aspect of this is that um, we also mentioned in our original grievance, as you can see, that not only in our in PSAC's opinion, the policy is a violation of different articles of the collective agreement, but it's also a violation of Section 7 of the uh, Human Rights Act. So. Uh, this is again another piece of federal legislation um, that requires a different uh, procedure and process. And we're also going to be filing a separate human rights complaint with the with the commission separately. Uh, but that's something you know, just like an individual grievance, you want to include as much as as you have in terms of issues that are raised in that grievance. So we did that here. Um, as you can see, this is a contravent. Uh, this is in uh, con in contravention of the following articles. So we included some of the articles from different collective agreements, and then in the end, uh, just like again an individual grievance, we list the corrective action or what we want as remedy, right, from this. So here we want a declaration from the employer that there has been a breach. Uh, we want the employer to stop. Um, this violating the collective agreement. Um, we want to make the employees whole. We want to make everybody who's affected, all the members that are affected by this whole. And that's important, as you know, from those who filed individual grievances. Because if you miss something in the remedies, for example, and then um, that you might be entitled to, including that article will kind of protect that. So um, from there, as I mentioned, the, the employer, according to the timelines in the collective agreement, has a certain amount of days to respond. 
and they don't they're not always the same they they vary those timelines so check the I mean, it's usually the union who does the policy. It, it is the union who does the policy grievance. So we are the ones who should be checking these, these timelines. Um, and then uh, the, again, the employer just goes on and on summarizing what we said, and then ends it with consequently your grievance and your request uh, for corrective actions are denied, right? So the employer here um, sees it differently um they insist that uh there's no evidence there's no examples that um the policy um either violates the collective agreement or uh viol is in breach of sex section 7 of the canadian human rights act we see it differently and of course we have been um, getting a lot of examples from individual members to support um, these arguments um so what happens after that? Uh, so now we've gone through the filing the grievance, we presented the grievance, and then the employer denied it. After that, we refer the grievance to adjudication at the um, uh, with the uh, with the board, and by the board I mean the federal public sector um, uh, labor 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 and employment board, which is. Um, kind of the body that's created by the legislation le legislation that, that I uh, uh, mentioned earlier in the act, creates this board to kind of um, make judgments and arbitrate and adjudicate um, these issues. So we referred it. Um, and here on the PowerPoint, you can see the employer gave us the response on September 4th we f we referred it to adjudication that same day right so we were prepared to, in case of a denial to do it right away because we want this matter to be heard in a um in a in, in a fast manner um we understand that our members are facing these challenges today we can't really afford um to wait a long time until the 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 matter gets scheduled at the board so we kindly asked them um that you know that this be heard in an expedited manner and in doing so when we did the referral because usually um you, we, we're supposed to kind of um go through or at least explore um mediation as as an option in this particular case we rejected mediation right at the get-go because we did not want to um, waste any any more time we had already met with the employer before we had already done our presentation um we didn't see any you know mediation might not be appropriate for this for this particular case but also from a timing perspective we wanted to make sure that we get results for our members as soon as we could right now where we're at in terms of this uh, policy grievance is um the hearing for this policy grievance is kind of dependent on the presentation of the second policy grievance because we asked for both of them to be joined together the second policy grievance as you can see on the screen um, which is also attached in the handouts that one we filed december uh, december 8th of 2020 and that one had to do with the new guidelines that the board implemented on november 9th these new guidelines, as I mentioned before, have to do with uh, the employer asking employees to exhaust all other leaves before digging into 699. So we filed another policy grievance because that's a violation of the collective agreement. Our arguments mainly here um, are that the employer is asking employees to use um, articles in the collective agreement that have been negotiated in bargaining um, for reasons other than those um, that they're supposed to um, to protect and they're supposed to serve. So when the employer is saying take your vacation leave when you actually are home and not able to work because of COVID, um, then that's if the employer's policy is that that's a violation of the collective agreement. Um, there's also human rights aspects in our policy grievances. The COVID-19 and leaves that are associated with COVID-19 and the ability and inability to complete work because of the pandemic has not affected everybody equally, right? 
So uh, we have women, for example, um, uh, face challenges that you know other members probably don't, and and those challenges are uh, magnified for for women, for example, single parents, um, um, people who live with disabilities, uh, people who live in smaller units, smaller homes where they don't have the ability to work uh, quietly, for example. You know, so you have so many different uh, discriminatory, potential discriminatory aspects that would affect different people differently. And this is uh, partially where the human rights argument kind of comes from. Um, so we found this second grievance and the board member who's the adjudicator agreed to join both grievances together to be heard together, which is great. That's what we wanted. So they said, okay, let's wait for you to present the second grievance to the employer. Um, so we're gonna be doing that on March 4th and we're gonna present the second grievance to the employer. Once we get the response, then the board knows that we wanna go into a hearing as soon as possible. Um, so we still don't have dates, but we want you to know that we're doing everything we can to have it uh, heard as soon as possible so we can get kind of a, of a response to our adjudication. Most recently, if we can move to the second, uh, to, to the next slide, we filed another policy grievance, uh, but you know, this should not have an effect on the timelines that we, I just mentioned. March 4th is the presentation for the second one. And then after we get a response, we'll, you know, the board will schedule us for a hearing. So we'll just go into adjudication. Um, but most recently we have been alerted by uh, at least one of the departments, one of our components, that the employer has been um, you know, requiring members and employees to um, flex their hours, their work hours, as I mentioned before, um, before they can even consider whether they will be given 699 leave or not. That includes, can you work on weekends? Can you work um, um, after hours? we have problems with that because that is another violation of all collective agreements uh, that we have including you know what happens to overtime what happens to the negotiated hours of work M many of our agreements have hours of work negotiated in the in the agreement itself so it says uh when it says seven hours a day uh monday to friday um anything you know uh out, you know, outside of that, in some collective agreements, should qualify for overtime. So when the employer is going and asking employees to flex hours uh, outside what is negotiated in the collective agreement and without the involvement of the union, that's a problem. Um, and so we filed another uh, policy grievance based on examples we were alerted to uh, by at least one of our components. Um, so at least one department, and since then we have been receiving other examples. That's another uh, place where we wanted to engage you folks um, to hear from you today, uh, because I feel like we might be getting, um, you know, a lot more. So I, I think the, uh, a lot more examples, but I think the next slide should be um, the question, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you. We have a, so uh, I will say the same thing. I will pull the question uh, for those of you guys who are steward. Have you represented a member who was denied access to a special leave during the last over the last uh, twelve months? So uh, let me start. And so you can open the um, you can click and uh, give your answer. So for the stewards, if you are you have your represented members who were denied. Uh, code 699 leave. Uh, Yafa, so it's uh, 721, so we'll, we'll go through that question and a few, and then uh, we, we hope to be able to open the floor to questions uh, after that. Okay. Okay, so uh, so I'm waiting a few more seconds to get, so uh, first two words, if you have represented a member who was denied, have you represented a member who was denied uh, access to special leave. So five more seconds and uh, we'll, we'll close the poll and show the results. So, okay. 
close and then we'll share so it's even so yeah uh, half, half have represented and the other half have not okay thank you um and maybe we, should we do the other one um regarding what yeah sure uh uh no the other one yeah um uh let's okay yeah let's launch this one so uh okay same thing if yeah so if you have answered yes to the previous question were were your claim uh, accepted denied or are you still waiting uh it's accepted or denied sorry we don't uh, we'll have a third option so once again for those who have answered yes to the previous question was uh, was it accepted or denied let's see more a few more seconds and uh I'll show the result. So I guess, yeah, how you won't be surprised by the result. <laughs> it's uh, okay. Five more seconds and I'll stop and show you the result. That's great. Okay. And share. So it's the two third were denied. Yeah. Mm, okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's see what's in there. Okay, you want to go to- uh, Actually, so before we do that yeah. quickly, I just want to go to what you can do if you're facing challenges very quickly, because uh, Alex sure. also um, uh, actually touched on that. Um, if you are facing challenges based on what we described now in terms of our what we think of 699, how the employer is implementing 699, um, first of all, always ask for 699 leave if you're fa facing challenges due to COVID-19 to complete the work. Always ask for it, okay? Document your request and um, uh, management's response to your request. So do it through email if possible when you ask for, for a 699 leave and try to get the employer's response to it in writing if possible again. Uh, reach out to your union rep and your local or component, whatever you, you know, what have you. If you have any questions about your situation regarding 699 leave, um, and then finally, you know, as, as I mentioned, you might be, a, you know, you might need to file individual grievances if the employer's denial is in violation of the collective agreement or in violation of their own policy. So we do want to encourage that because these are examples that are also going to help us with the policy grievance, but also we want to get you um, results as soon as possible and as fast as, as possible. Get the union involved and um, we might be able to even, you know, resolve the issues after you file the grievance um, through speaking to the employer. It doesn't work all the time, but um, you know, your local reps will will try as much as possible. Um, do we have time to go through the scenarios, or should we skip the questions? We do maybe one scenario, and then we can go through the question. I don't know which one you want to do. The uh, um, let's border. do the second one. Okay. Let's this one yeah yeah so I just put a scenario here just to see um, what you folks think um, so we have a member uh, it's just an example we have a member who's a border service officer and who's at high risk his doctor issued him a certificate indicating that he's at high risk uh, and must work from home during COVID-19 pandemic the member sent the certificate to the employer and requested to go on 699 paid leave the employer did not have any alternative work or duties that this member can complete from home. Um, all the work that's available must be completed from work. Is this member eligible for 699 paid leave? Okay, I would so like we to have, okay, we'll launch the poll. Same thing, so you can answer yes or no to the. So, what do you think you will be able? This that member is eligible for that paid leave. So yes or no. So everybody can answer according to your what you think, and we'll leave you a few more seconds to answer. So, do you think that member in that scenario will be uh, available? Will be uh, eligible for the, the paid leave? And I just want to uh, qualify. Is the member eligible according to the employer's policy? Okay. And that's different than should the member be eligible? Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's see. Uh, maybe we have probably have a mixed <laughs> a mixed uh, kind of answer. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's probably 
members probably uh, you probably answer what you think we should be the um, but uh, Yafa, what's your take on it? Uh, okay, this is very interesting. I I thought this question was gonna be answered um, the same way, <laughs> so I'm I'm happy. But I I just want to say um, I bet you if we send this exact same scenario to all the employers and all the different managers with the same request or similar, we might get results in terms of denial or acceptance of uh, 699 leave requests very similar to the results of this poll. So that means that different managers and different supervisors are going to interpret this scenario differently and the results was, is gonna be different. And this is a very good reflection of how the employer is not implementing the policy consistently. Um, from reading the employer's own policy, you know, this member, uh, they have uh, exhausted the alternative work arrangements. It doesn't work because the nature of the work requires the member to be, for example, uh, present at the border. You know, they cannot do that from over the computer at home um, in order to complete the tasks, right? So that option is gone. Um, next, um, technically, according to the original policy, the, em the employee should be eligible for 699. However, after November 9, the employer now is saying, you will have to exhaust other leaves in your in your collective agreement then maybe you will be eligible for 699 leave so i'm i'm sorry it's not a yes or no clear like a uh, simple answer but i'm just trying to explain how the process and how the employer is you know um their their rationale but also how they're inconsistently applying um the policy but i'm happy now to open it up and hear from you um and and uh take some questions as much as we can and sorry i went over time it's okay. Uh, I'll start with the first one, and Elizabeth will will alternate with Elizabeth. But the the one is uh, uh, there's Luigi who asks. I don't I don't, don't have to go through the whole question, but basically is uh, he has ex exhausted all his uh, uh, vacation leave and personal leave, and he's out right now out of sick leave. So I think you you refer to that at this point. He could he could ask the for the code six nine nine leave if. He still need leave to take care of other uh, himself or his family, I guess. Eh? Yeah. So, um, so here the the um, I, I don't think I see the question. It hasn't been answered, right? Um, so the member exhausted all of their leaves mm -hmm. and and yes. have children at home. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So now, yeah, you should be asking. Now, I, I just want to clarify something about um, child care and uh, caregiving. The employer will be asking, um, do you have any alternative um, child care arrangements that you can use before we can determine that? Um, the, you know, they're going to they're going to ask, do, is there a spouse or another parent in the household? who can provide this child care arrangement. Again, we don't think those are right questions to be asking, but the that's the employer's policy. They're going to be asking these. So if, if those are not options, are, are not you know, possible, you should be eligible for 699 leave. If in that case, the employer is not giving you 699 leave, then you really need to contact the union because you might be, need to grieve that. Um, so it can be resolved either through your union directly speaking with the employer or through the grievance process. Okay, thank you. It, it Thanks, is Jeff, I think... Yeah, I'm going to go ahead. So I have somebody here, uh, Kevin, who's asking if an employee was granted leave under the code 699 at the start of the pandemic uh, due to family needs under the original Treasury Board policy and their leave is now denied under a similar, like the same circumstances, um, would that can constitute a form of estoppel? Mm. Uh, that's a good question. Um, no, I, I don't think we're gonna. I, I don't think uh, we can succeed in the estoppel argument here. But uh, definitely, it's a violation of the collective agreement. Um, but you know, maybe I, 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 we have to look into that argument. But it, it wouldn't be the first one that I would go to. Um, but that's. But it's a good way to think about it, right? Because of past practice. Um, but you know, I I don't know how successful uh, estoppel would be when we have you know a, a low hanging fruit um, 
that is a lot more, you know, um, winnable, I would say. Of course, we can't predict that we win or we lose, but um, th there are certain arguments that are uh, a little bit stronger, in my opinion. And I could be wrong, but. Uh, we have another uh, case. Uh, Yafa uh, Marie Jose says uh, basically, okay, she agreed to do flexible hours, but at one point, the, the computer system was not available after those hours. So what, what she can do regarding uh, that case uh, scenario? So she oh. actually agreed to do flexible hours, but she was not able to access the the employer's computer after those uh, after uh, doing uh, certain hours. Is the employer aware of that? Uh, that's I don't have that information. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, well, if the if the member is still on on the line, if yeah, they can, yeah. let us know if the employer's uh, been aware of, of that, and and mm -hmm. you know if they are, then what was their response? Um, do they yeah, have Marie, a solution? Yeah, Marie Jose is there, so I will open your mic, Marie Jose, if you want to. Uh, just click on your microphone and you can uh, you can give more information to Yafa. Go ahead. Yeah. You, your mic is open, so you, if you ask your question, we, sh we should be able to hear you. Okay. No, I think she has uh, some issue. We'll, we'll we'll move to another question, Elizabeth. Yeah. No problem. Um, but yeah, I, I mean. Uh, Again, check with the what the employer says about that. Um, and you know, again, I want to reiterate that um, it is problematic for the employer to be asking for flexible hours. Now, you know, it's uh, of course in the end of the day, it's up for for employees, but uh, it is a violation of the collective agreement as it exists. So that's something to consider if you want to check with your union, uh, union rep, sorry, and uh, and see, you know, if, if you wanna. Um, challenge that or or have the union ask more questions on your behalf uh, to the employer. Okay, uh, thank you. I have another question. I have a question here from Yagusha who's asking about, uh, so what happens when you're forced to quarantine in a hotel uh, just after getting off the plane uh, for two weeks? Uh, I'm just losing the question, but basically the question was, uh, it seems that the employer is denying um 699 leave for that purpose mm -hmm. when it's clearly an obligation people are being forced to wear quarantine um can do you have anything to sh any wisdom to share about that yeah so again same thing doesn't matter that you're quarantining in the hotel according to the employer uh employer's policy i mean if you're if you tested positive for covid 19 you're required by law to stay at home for 14 days right um and quarantine so even in that, um, the employer is not giving 699 right away. They're saying you have to dig into your other, um, or they're going to say, are you able to work remotely? If that is a possibility, then you should be working remotely, even if you're positive for COVID-19 without any symptoms. Like some people are positive, but they're not, you know, they don't have symptoms. And um, in that case, you know, they're going to be asked, can can alternative work arrangements happen first? So in this scenario, even if it's the hotel and even it doesn't matter where it is, um, the employer is going to first ask, OK, can you work from the hotel if that is an, a, a possibility? Um, if that's not a possibility, then they're going to say, well, you have to dig into um, into uh, your other leaves. Another good question. That's a good question because it has to do with travel. And so I do want to alert folks that for travel, the employer may um, be implementing this differently. And again, that's according to their own policy, depending on the reason for travel. Because, you know, if, if you are um, outside of the country for, um, or even for any reason, really, um, it, it might be challenging. The employer has not been, um, you know, very flexible when it comes to travel and then, um, Ask, you know, having uh, employees access 699 leave um, because the public health authorities um, and advisories have been saying no travel. So um, I, I highly doubt in this case that it will be um, accepted. But if you think that in your particular situation, it should be according to what I explained about 699 leave, then you need to contact your union for clarification for sure, um, just, just to make sure. 
because again, every example in the end of the day is unique. Thanks, Yafa. You're welcome. Uh, Pierre, do you want me to continue, or do you? Yeah, yeah, go I ahead. have another one here from okay. Patrick, who's asking: leave pro, uh, leave profiling has been tougher lately. Pro, profiling or approvals have been tougher lately. What can what can and should be done for employees who are being given discipline due to leave being taken in relation with COVID nineteen? So basically, the they're being denied, but they still have to take the leave either because they're sick or they have to quarantine. This, if it, let's say in the context where somebody's a shift worker, uh, I know Patrick, he works shifts and it's an operational job. Okay, I have follow up questions. Uh, what, what is meant by leave profiling? Um, can we, Pia, do you know how we can un unmute Patrick? Let me just see, I will see if I can unmute Let, Patrick. So can Patrick, explain. Patrick Davy, Davy, what. Okay, Patrick, I will open your mic. Just click on your mic and you'll be able to ask your question. So you need to click on your microphone. The microphone, I, oh, go ahead. Hello. Oh, Hi. Yeah, you're good. Hi. Yeah, so uh, leave profiling. Uh, we have uh, certain employees who have been uh, essentially told that their leave is uh, exceeding a certain amount, uh, be it sick leave or family leave and then what happens is uh, the employer pulls them in and says uh, you've been taking too much leave we need to do xyz things and then mm -hmm. they're they're prone to getting disciplined afterwards but a lot of this has been as a result of COVID-19 right so what what can we and should we be doing in these instances and I think it's a question that uh, could uh, yeah. benefit a lot of people right of course um and that's definitely and i mean just without hearing the examples if, if folks so the employer can say leaves are discretionary in many cases right because um even in the collective agreement it it they depend on operational requirements so i'm sure that some folks here have maybe faced a situation where they would uh submit a, a leave request a vacation request right um, and then you're faced with a situation where everybody submitted the vacation request at the same time then it's you know getting they have to go through uh seniority and and whatever is in the collective agreement as to who can go and who can't during that time but the you know the employer can say well we denied it at that time because of operational requirements because we can't have nobody working that day so it really depends on the reasons the employer is giving. It also depends on the situation. So if the person is unable to work because of COVID, they shouldn't be requesting uh, vacation leave to start with, right? So um, even, even though 699 leave in itself has a disc like discretionary element to it, um, if, if, you know, if people, so the short answer is, um, I, I'm as you know again and just by hearing this uh this may um actually call for a grievance or multiple <laughs> grievances so um I would check with your union union rep because um the issue of discipline is alarming um and the fact that you know um just saying you're taking too many leaves um unless you know they're arguing that it's uh, an operational requirement but again if it's COVID related, really, um, it shouldn't be even going there. So yeah, from just from assessing based on what I heard without knowing exactly the full situation, I would say it may it, it likely may trigger a grievance. Thank you. Uh, it's Pierre again. Uh, don't, so don't despair if we don't go to your question. We, as we said earlier, we have all your written questions and we can follow up with you. I have two questions that are related. Yep. Uh, so yeah. uh, Carol asking for a person. So uh, regarding to the employer's policy right now, uh, members are obligated to take all their sick and vacation leave before they can access 699? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's the, the, the gist, gist of the... and. Um, uh, and so the grievance will deal with that. If, if we win the grievance, people will recoup their uh, uh, personal leave and vacation leave uh, that were that they had for they were forced to use uh, during the uh, <clears throat> their leave. Eh? I cannot. No, I can't no. answer that question myself. Okay. This is going to be answered by the adjudicator. Okay. At a so we cannot predict that. But what we can say is, we will do everything we can and we will fight as much as we can 
to get the best remedy um, out of this, but we cannot, you know, say for certain or, or even predict what the outcome will be. So unfortunately, I can't answer that question. Only the adjudication will. Okay, duly noted. Uh, Elizabeth? Or uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, so we have several questions asking the same thing. <clears throat> Basically, what, what will happen if we win the grievances? As you said earlier, it will yeah. depend on the, 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 the education response, uh, educator response. Exactly. So um, if you, you know, if you have the handouts in front of you, you can take a look at the grievances again and, and look at the correct um, corrective action part. So that's what we're asking for now. You know, it also is kind of open in terms of making the employees and the members whole. So uh, again, whatever the law permits us to ask for in terms of rem remedy, uh, whatever, you know, um, we assess in terms of um, the situation uh, within, of course, again, the jurisdiction and, and the, the law, uh, what, what it um, allows us to do, we'll be asking for all of that. Okay, thank you. I'm going through the, um, <clears throat> the list of questions. Uh, sorry if you don't go through all the, the questions, but we, as we said yeah, earlier, we keep them. <clears throat> yeah, we can follow up with some members after that. Just want yeah. to see. Um, yes, there's a lot of question about remedies, but that we cannot answer until until we see the uh, the educator response. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. I, have, uh, I just want to say, uh, Pierre, please. If, uh, you know, that's why we're stressing also that we are looking for individual examples. So. Um, I mean, all of the scenarios that you're, you know, that we're getting aware of is because the members are informing us of them. Um, if, you know, if there are situations where, because some members do not get in touch with the union if they're facing with it and they'll just, you know, get denied and move on, um, you know, and if that's their choice, that's fine. But, you know, if you're, if you're really not sure, please get in touch with, uh, with the union. Uh, because it's important for us to know some of the examples. And some of those individual grievances that we file will be using in the policy grievance as examples, just to show this is what the policy is actually, these are the effects of the policy on the ground, right? We have, you know, a sick, we have a member who's taking care of a sick mother, uh, for example, who needs um, to be giving her um, chemotherapy treatment two hours a day, um, a single mom, you know, there's no other caregiver, there's no alternative, and that member is being denied 699 leave for two hours to give, like, these examples are, not only are we going to be fighting for those, mem for those members to get the, the, the leave that they're entitled to, as per the collective agreement, and try to get it now, but we'll also be bringing them as examples, right? So our our objection here um, is to get the members the 699 leave as needed as soon as possible, and we'll deal with the legal battle. But you know the individual grievances also help as examples, and even with those, we'll still continue to try to get you the 699 uh, as much as possible. Sometimes we don't succeed. Sometimes we do. There's a member asking, so she was told not even to ask for the leave 699 because the, the employer said it would be denied, but you said earlier that we should, you should ask for it and then if, if it's denied, then it can be part of the, the policy grievance that we are filing, eh? Or it could be grieved individually, grieved. right? Okay. Uh, not, you know, we're not going to use every single example as an example because, you know, but we're going to be choosing which ones. Um, but it should be, you know, the employer should not say, do not make that request. Um, if that's a, an issue where, where that particular member works, um, please alert us to, to that. If the employer is telling you don't even apply for 699 leave because you have the right to request it. Uh, and without it being requested and then getting, getting denied, we can't grieve it, right? So if the employer is saying that, that's also a problem. 
<clears throat> there's another question is so the fiscal year will come uh, in, in the government next april so basically all the uh, annual leave and uh, family to leave will be reset uh, so will be if if we're still in the battle with the employer it will probably go through the same motion so asking you to take uh, uh, vacation leave family leave before you can access the 699 yeah Yes, exactly. And that's a good question because we heard from some members um, and some departments that the, uh, so you know how you have some leaves and some, you know, some leaves are, are part of the calendar year and some years, uh, so, sorry, some leaves are uh, part of um, just the uh, collect, like the collective agreement year. So, and some of them you bank and they carry move forward and others don't. Uh, so some employers have been implementing the you exhaust your sick leave differently, right? So some are saying that when we say exhaust your sick leave, we mean just for this year, even if you have banked more from before. So that is something that, you know, I would say clarify with the employer, uh, do it in writing. So if you have a sick leave banked for more than what you entitled to in that one year of the one calendar year, um, when the employer says exhaust all of your sick leaves, clarify with them if that means all of my sick leaves, like even if I have banked, you know, um, more, you know, like from, from other years or just from that one year, because some employers were saying only just from the year. So if you're entitled to, let's say, I don't know, um, one week of sick leave per year, accord, as per the collective agreement, I'm just giving that as an example. When the employer says exhaust, that means only that one week or those seven days of sick leave, even if you had like 60 days banked of sick, of sick leave. So it would be interesting for us also to know if that's consistent across the board. Um, so please let us know if that's, you know, if that's something that you can find out. I have a question. It's quite interesting. I have a question. Uh, oh, go ahead, Elizabeth. Go, go ahead, Kat. Well, it's a oh. question that um, you, you, you mentioned, uh, Yafa, that people should let you know about different situations. What's the best way to go about that to inform you of situations going on that can help you in your case? Is it through filing individual grievances? Do you want them to get in touch with uh, their local and then that they go through the regional office? What for you do you think? Because I mean, if you don't want to end up with uh, <laughs> 20,000 yeah. emails going directly to you, Yafa, yeah, what is the best way for folks to inform us about the situations? Yeah, no, exactly. And, and actually, my job in, in my job description, um, I shouldn't be uh, doing that directly because it has to go through the local representatives first and the components, right? Because uh, they're equipped better. They know what, the work on the ground and they know, you know, what to do. Um, and then we work with, with components and local uh, regional reps and local reps, you know, depending which department you're in, um, directly if they need our help, right? So um they'll get in touch with us and say here's another example and this is what we did we filed a grievance or can you give us your opinion should we grieve this if needed but they are very equipped um and, and they know what to do so uh yeah get in touch with your um you know local, okay, local great. yeah awesome and i just wanted to mention to folks on the line that because i saw in some of the questions if folks don't know who their union rep is or have an issue get you to find a union rep, please call the regional office. If you can uh, wind up for the uh, for the webinar with the regional website, you can find our, our number and we will be happy to connect you to uh, your local or to your component or both so mm -hmm. that they can help you either determine to file a grievance or help you through the process. Okay, so please call. Yeah, and all the yeah, component information is available online if you just, you know, Google your component's name and you'll see who the component representatives are and you know if you're not sure you can email them i guess okay i have so i have a good question here if both spouses work uh, for the, our pscc members uh, under the same collective agreement and the employees say ask your spouse to take care of your kids but you know the, so what what would be uh, what would be your suggestion for uh, so the first part was if both 
um, spouses work for the same employer? Yeah. Well, the employer cannot say, cannot request that your spouse or partner looks after the kids while you work. That what the employer is going to do is as part of uh, acquiring documentation for the request, will ask, do you have alternative child care, care uh, arrangements or options, such as, do you have a spouse in the house who can maybe look after them so you can work instead of you going on 699 leave? Do you have a parent who lives with you who can, do you have older children? Now, again, do we think these are right and correct? Maybe not. Uh, sometimes it's reasonable, sometimes they're not. Um, but if, again, if both, both, uh, spouses, then I think in that case, you know, you that even that's easier. You, you say we have the same employer, so you know my spouse is working. So no, I do not have alternative uh, uh, childcare arrangements. Um, you know, it's either me or my spouse who are going to be on 699 because one of us will have to look after the kids. Or you can, you know, uh, ask for a different 699 leaves at different times so you can rotate. But um, in my opinion, that should make it easier, actually, if if it's the same employer. Okay, uh, so uh, obviously, this uh, someone is asking if your employer is a crown corporation, can the leave the six nine nine leave happen in such a situation? I guess it is for for several uh, crown corporation that we represent, eh? If what was the first part? If what? If, if, if someone works for a crown corporation like the uh, one of the agency or uh, that have the same uh, the same clause in their collective agreement. Yeah, exactly. There won't be uh, not all of them have the same wording, but similar, very similar. They're, they're, they exist there even for crown and other agencies. In fact, we filed them for some agencies as well. Okay. Uh, I think at this point we have, as we said, some some of the questions. It's not they are not interested. It's they are too too more too much information. So we'll keep those in writing and and follow up with you with you guys. Uh, unless Elizabeth, you have you see something that uh, can be uh, asked? No, I think uh, yeah. There's some that have a lot of detail. We'll get back to folks who we didn't answer. For sure. Some are question. really specific. Sorry, I just want to add one more thing um, in case maybe it would um, generate some other questions for folks to send us in writing uh, that we didn't get into today. But in terms of uh, the employer asking for documentation, I did mention the issue of privacy and confidentiality and you know that it's reasonable, but to limit. Um, please let us know and alert us because it has been an issue as well in some situations where the employer is asking unreasonably confidential inf medical information if let's say you're requesting 699 because you're taking care of your ill spouse or mom or dad and um, the employer will start asking confidential medical information about that other person in your household that you're taking care of who's not an employee uh, of that same employer um, asking medical questions about them right this is this is a big issue this is also a human rights issue uh as well as um you know um it's not reasonable and we should not be provide the, the employer should not be asking for such um requests so if you're facing with faced with that issue or if you need to know uh about your particular situation in particular put it in a question and we'll we'll try to address that or speak to your uh to your uh union Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, four to to uh, seven uh, to eight. Sorry. So at this point, I think we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll ask. we we'll thank you, Yafa, for for your information. So thank basically, you, uh, you will, all the participants will receive tomorrow a follow-up email, which uh, will include uh, uh, the uh, a PDF version of that presentation. Of the slide that we presented tonight, you already have the uh, the document, but we'll probably be able to add the the five documents, the uh, the grievance uh, and the employer response to the to the uh, to the email. 
So I just want to thank Yefa for uh, your information. Thank you for all of you for your participation. We're sorry if we, we were not able to get to all the questions, but as we said several times now, uh, all the written questions, we keeping we are keeping them. We have your email address uh, attached to it. So we'll be able to follow up uh, either from, we'll ask your local to follow up or we'll do that from the regional office. So thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Yafa. And uh, I will, at this point, I will um, end this webinar. And uh, we, uh, uh, last information, this, this webinar was recorded. So on Friday, we'll be able to put, to put the link uh, to uh, a, a YouTube version of the webinar. So if you, uh, if you had to leave or if you know someone who was not able to attend, it will be, uh, the recording will be available. Okay, so thanks, thanks again, Yafa. And thanks you all for your participation. And this is the end of the webinar. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye.